Hello, my name is Dr. Jennifer Lightdale, and I am Division Chief of Pediatric Gastroenterology and Nutrition at UMass Memorial Children's Medical Center and a professor of pediatrics at the University of Massachusetts Medical School in Worcester, Massachusetts. The learning objectives of this talk are to discuss early life exposures that shape the composition and function of the gut microbiome, to recognize the integral relationship between the gut microbiome and the immune system, to illustrate environmental influences on the early development of the microbiome and the immune system, and to describe clinical implications of emerging research on the microbiome, including the role of nutrition in its optimization. The microbiome is an extremely large and complex community of microorganisms, including bacteria, fungi, and viruses, as well as their genetic material that lives in or on our human bodies. These microorganisms live in a symbiotic and mutualistic relationship with us as their human hosts, and they're actually essential for mediating human physiology, metabolism, and our immune systems to the world. The human microbiome includes more than 40 trillion bacterial cells per person, which is actually more than an individual human body itself, which is composed of about 30 trillion cells. And each individual's microbiome, each one of us, involves more than 1,000 different bacterial species. And I think it's really amazing to realize that humans have evolved with their microbiome over millions of years. In many ways, a healthy microbiome is the key to human health, while an unhealthy microbiome, or what we call dysbiosis, can be associated with diseases or other poor health outcomes. Our innate and adaptive immune systems are also critical to our health and have highly evolved over millions of years. Our immune system is an interactive group of cells and molecules that serves to protect our bodies from disease. When it functions ideally, our immune system is actively monitoring and responding to foreign or non-self molecules that may represent threats to our bodies such as infectious microbes. The whole system really relies on the immune system being able to recognize what is a threat from what is benign, and there are many benign foreign molecules such as the proteins in food that we don't want our immune systems to react to. As a gastroenterologist, I am highly aware of the immune system because 70 to 80 percent of it is actually located in the mucosa, or the cellular lining of the gastrointestinal tract, right alongside the gut microbiome. This has de facto set up further evidence of the evolutionarily important relationship that is going on in the gut between the immune system and the gut microbiome. When we talk about the gut microbiome, we are talking about the microbial community that is located inside the lumen of the human intestine. And it turns out that the gut microbiome is particularly critical to human health and survival. We are learning much more about the bi-directional relationship the gut microbiome has with our immune system, including how our individual microbiomes protect us from lethal infections and also reduce the potential for our immune systems to go haywire and cause autoimmune or other allergic reactions. In particular, what we've learned is that the gut microbiome influences the immune system in two main ways. First, it provides antigens or molecules that actually stimulate our immune system to get it to act in good ways. Secondly, the microbiome sends chemical signals that can affect the behavior of the immune system and literally help it to stay calm and not engage in dysfunctional behaviors. So our microbiome is essentially controlling our immune system, hopefully in good ways. This picture shows how the gut microbiome at the top and the immune system underneath are separated by a single layer of intestinal epithelial cells or what we call the mucosa. On the luminal side is mucin or essentially mucus in which the gut microbiome resides. The immune system lies below the intestinal epithelium in either the tissue of the gut or in vascular spaces. 
The microbiome is sending its signals both between and through the intestinal epithelial cells to influence the behavior of the immune system. And ideally, this is in healthy ways, not in bad ways. So as it turns out, early life of humans is extremely important for establishing the composition of the gut microbiome and by definition, the behavior of the immune system. Factors that affect the composition of the gut microbiome include, importantly, our diets and our environment. The bidirectional symbiotic relationship of the microbiome and the immune system means that the healthy development of the immune system relies on the healthy development of a microbiome. And since this all happens very early in life, it truly reflects infant feeding practices as well as both prenatal and postnatal environmental exposures. And when we say early, we really mean it, as the gut microbiome both is constituted and assembled and then essentially completely stabilized during the first two years of life, which is otherwise known as the first 1,000 days of life. This means that any disruption of an infant's microbiome can contribute to lifelong and even intergenerational poor health. Non-ideal microdevelopment has also been linked to poor growth and development when you're dealing with toddlers and school-age children, as well as cardiac, neurologic, autoimmune, and allergic diseases, both during these early phases of life as well as in later stages. What all of this means is that it is really the first 1,000 days of life defined in humans from conception to two years of age that is really when your lifelong health is being determined. Those early 1,000 days involve rap rapid maturation of a number of different human body pathways, including metabolic, endocrine, neural, and immune pathways that are all developing in tandem and are actually highly interdependent. Each of these pathways, and therefore any and all of them, can be adversely affected by environmental factors, such as infections or suboptimal nutrition. But it's not usually just one issue that disrupts the microbiome and affects health. It's usually really a myriad of factors that can be implicated, including maternal diets, pre- and postnatally, as well as environmental exposures. There's also postnatal infant diets as well as postnatal dietary exposures. So these are all going to be playing in. In addition, there can be genetics, epigenetics, or what are called changes to your genes because of the environment, as well as metabolomics, defined as the presence or absence of specific metabolites in cells and other factors that can also be playing in. In this slide, I have listed out some of the factors that have been shown to affect the microbiome during the first 1,000 days. In particular, prenatal maternal factors, including exposure to maternal gut microbiota, vaginal infections, and even tooth issues like periodontitis can have an impact on a baby's microbiome. Certainly, delivery mode at birth can be a factor. And postnatal infant exposures, including antibiotics and dietary exposures, can be interplaying with genetics and environmental exposures, all to affect a baby's microbiome. We know that probiotics can be used ideally to influence the microbiome in good ways, and there may be ideal types and timing for introduction of older babies to complementary foods that can be good for development of the microbiome. And we are just starting to understand how toddler diets may be a factor in both good and or bad ways as the microbiome really starts to stabilize towards the end of the second year of life. Some of the evidence for how all this plays out comes from examining the composition of the microbiome at different time points, and specifically by looking at the preterm gut microbiome. What we know is that in normal pregnancy, Gut microbes of the fetus reflect the variety of microbes present in the placenta, umbilical cord, amniotic fluid, and meconium. Furthermore, recent findings have shown how the preterm gut microbiome follows a three-phased pattern of assembly, moving from bacilli as the predominant bacterial species in early life, 
changing to gamma proteobacteria with fermentation-based metabolism when complementary foods are added in at about six months of age, and ultimately featuring clostridia by about two years of age, which are the predominant bacterial species in adult microbiomes. We also know that the microbiome of the newborn closely matches maternal stool, vaginal, and skin microbiomes, and this explains why an infant's microbiome depends on how they were born. Either way, at birth, the first colonizers again are bacilli, while other types of bacteria accumulate over the next six months dependent upon infant feeding practices. In breastfed infants, the microbiome is dominated by a species involved in HMO metabolism, reflecting the fact that about a third of infant bacterial microbiota in breastfed infants originates from breast milk. In fact, the extraordinary mutual relationship of the microbiome and the human immune system is perhaps best illustrated by understanding how HMOs, or human milk oligosaccharides, work. These are a complex, diverse group of sugars that are one of the top four ingredients in human breast milk, after water, lipids, and lactose. What's fascinating about HMOs is they actually have no direct nutritional value for infants, but are rather designed to feed the microbiome. Intestinal bacteria use the HMOs in human breast milk to generate short-chain fatty acids, which in turn are critical for gut health and are involved in modulating immune responses. HMOs also have a function where they directly and indirectly prevent disease by reducing the ability of bad bacteria and viruses to bind to gut epithelium. We also know that the microbiome of breastfed and formula-fed infants differ, and that this can have an effect on health. Breastfed infants have high levels of bifidobacteria and lactobacillus, in large part because they are exposed to both human breast milk and to human skin. In contrast, formula-fed infants have a higher proportion of clostridium and proteobacteria and may have a comparatively less diverse microbiome at one year of life. In one small study of NICU patients, breastfeeding was found to be protective against neck. And several epidemiological studies have further suggested relationships between infant feeding, microbiome, and disease by showing that breastfeeding may have a protective role in the development of asthma, autism spectrum disorders, and type 1 diabetes, while formula feeding may be more associated with higher risks of inflammatory and auto in, uh, autoimmune diseases. Of course, infants at some point start eating solid foods, and we know that this introduction initiates a rapid increase in the diversity of the infant microbiome, ultimately creating a mature, adult-like microbiome by two years of age that is dominated by microbial species capable of degrading glycans, mucin, and complex carbohydrates, as well as producing short-chain fatty acids on their own. This transition of an infant microbiome to a more adult microbiome in the second year of life is both necessary and beneficial because the adult microbial community is better equipped to extract energy and process from diets that are higher in fiber and protein versus the HMO-based diet that a breastfeeding infant has. It is important to recognize that developmentally appropriate solid food introduction and associated changes in the microbiome also correspond with other critical phases of childhood, including linear growth and maturation of the thymus. Disruptions or alterations in optimal maturation of the microbiome can adversely affect these developmental phases, and vice versa in that disruptions in linear growth or endocrine function can affect the microbiome. For example, having multiple ear infections may mean exposures to antibiotics, which can affect your microbiome and therefore linear growth and development. Conversely, infections may affect growth, and this can affect the microbiome. Either way, once the microbiome is affected, there is the potential to adversely affect the immune system. There are a number of ways that environmental factors can either enhance or disrupt the microbiome. 
Enhancers of a healthy microbiome have been shown to include exposure to animals, as well as healthy diets, including the Mediterranean diet with high fiber complex carbohydrates, fruits, and vegetables. Microbiome disruptors can include malnutrition, sometimes due to food insecurity, poor diets, pollution, cigarette smoke, exposure to pathogenic microbes, and medications. So in summary, early environmental factors include type of delivery, type of infant feeding, and timing and type of introductory solid foods. Other microbiome disruptors, again, can include medications, Western diets that are high in saturated fats and low in fiber and protein, stress, which increases cortisol, which can affect intestinal permeability and decrease short chain fatty acid production. We also know that smoking and exposure to secondhand smoke is clearly associated with changes in the microbiome, likely in part because of decreased colonic mucin production. The effects of disrupting the microbiome on the immune system are also clear. The model for how this happens is that the disruption to the microbiome, especially in genetically susceptible populations, leads the immune system to start acting badly. An example of this is antibiotic use and or dietary changes in the presence of genetic NOD2 mutations. This combination of disruption of the microbiome and a genetic predisposition has been shown to lead to changes in the microbiome and dysregulation of the immune system, and particularly to result in inflammatory bowel disease. So this is how microbiome disruption and NOD2 mutations seem to be a perfect storm for developing IBD. As another example, we also know that frequent infections in childhood and or perhaps lots of antibiotic use, whether needed or not needed, can lead to microbiome changes. And that can lead to immune system dysregulation. And ultimately, we see children develop allergic diseases, such as food allergies, asthma, or eczema. In conclusion, the clinical implications and key takeaway points from this talk are the following. First, maintaining a healthy microbiome is really the key to having a healthy immune system. Fiber, which we see in good diets such as the Mediterranean diet, are really good for the microbiome and for the immune system. And this is compared with low fiber Western diets, which are high in processed sugars, fats, and other food ingredients, which also can be detrimental to the microbiome. I think we've also discussed the importance of considering adverse effects of medications on the microbiome when assessing their risks versus benefits in particular clinical scenarios. We've also discussed modifiable risk factors, and one of those may be the timing and choice of complementary food introductions in children. This is an area we expect to learn more about in the near future. For now, encouraging and advocating for breastfeeding remains paramount as human breast milk seems uniquely qualified to promote a healthy microbiome in human infants at a critical period for establishing their healthy microbiome and ultimately their healthy immune system. Thank you. I have listed on this slide and the next some references. <music> <laughs>